Thank you, Professor McFarlane, for your kind words, and especially for your dedication in the battle to make our justice system accessible, affordable, and reliable for ordinary Canadians. To the Ontario Civil Liberties Association and the Executive Advisory Board and staff, my sincere thanks for honoring me with this award. I cannot overstate the importance of this Civil Liberties Award both to myself as validation and support for my work, but also the importance of the award in drawing attention to the great danger to our civil liberties when corruption invades our justice system and becomes normalized, as it has. Today, I've been asked to talk about what happened to me as my legal case, a civil dispute over a high-value uh, estate, made its way through various levels of courts in Ontario, Canada. I'm also going to explore how so many decent, ordinary Canadians are forced to represent themselves in our courts without a lawyer, and how common it is for them to experience outright hostility, procedural abuses, and deliberate misconduct by the legal profession that has come to value winning at any cost. A legal profession where too many value winning over honor, over integrity, over duty to the public trust and the rule of law. We are also going to look at how the legal profession is allowed to self-govern and operate without modern standards of independent oversight and external accountability. And on that very subject, today I am calling upon the Law Society of Ontario and the law societies in every province to cease investigating complaints against their own members. This most serious conflict of interest undermines the profession's credibility and the public's trust. Self-investigation by the lawyers' unions is a real conflict of interest that is unacceptable by any modern standard and cannot be resolved, except by the establishment of independent organizations in each province to receive complaints against lawyers, to perform professional and unbiased investigations, and to lay charges where appropriate. The retention of investigative functions by the law societies is indefensible. Later, as my final topic, I'm going to reveal details of an ongoing major scandal, an active cover-up by the Courts Administration Service and the Federal Court of Canada that impacts every Canadian who has appeared before that court for any reason in the last few years. If you are a lawyer with clients appearing before the Federal Court of Canada now or in the last few years, you will be keenly interested in the news that I will be breaking today. A number of lawyers have contacted me and are already exploring legal options for their clients. There should be no secret evidence or secret backroom hearings in our courts. This misconduct undermines the very foundations of our justice system and destroys the public's faith in a fair and impartial court. Secret proceedings and secret evidence are devastating to all Canadians before the courts, but especially so for those who cannot afford a lawyer and are forced to represent themselves. Yet, as you will see, secret evidence and private backroom hearings happen every day in our courts. Now, before we begin the story of my personal case, for those interested in examining the details in more depth, you will find court documents, source evidence, affidavits, voice recordings, and other exhibits at my website, donaldbest.ca. There you will also find the names of the corrupt lawyers, law firms, judges, and police officers that I'm not going to mention by name here today. We're going to keep it big picture for this talk. I only have so much time. But if you want to know the names of the corrupt lawyers and the others, they can be found at my website where they've been published for several years. 
A Google search will also reveal some of the news media coverage of my case, including print and radio interviews, and most recently, my appearance on the Jimmy Dore Show out of Los Angeles. I'll begin by telling you how several corrupt senior lawyers from some of Canada's largest law firms together fabricated false evidence, bribed police, and lied to the courts to convict me of contempt of court in a civil lawsuit's cost hearing. A hearing that I was not notified of and not present for as I was in Asia at the time and not in Canada. As one example of their corrupt actions, during a group telephone conversation, the lawyers asked me whether I had received a certain court order. Twelve times during that call, I denied receiving the court order and asked that it be sent to me. After the call, the lawyers immediately created a formal statement for the record, a court document that falsely indicated I had for informed them during the call that I had indeed received the court order the day before. This was a deliberate fabrication of evidence, a lie. But they submitted their false statement as evidence to the court. Later, during a hearing that I was not notified of and was not, therefore not present for, the lawyers doubled down on their false statement for the record by confirming it orally on the court transcript. Further, they submitted a sworn affidavit falsely stating that they had couriered the order to me at an address in Canada. The judge convicted me of contempt of court upon the lawyer's false evidence, sentenced me to three months in prison, and issued a warrant for my arrest. The lawyers did not know that I had secretly and legally recorded my telephone conversation with them. They did not know that I was in Asia. Evidence from the courier company later showed that, contrary to their sworn affidavit, the lawyers had never sent the court order to me in Canada or anywhere else. And they couldn't produce any courier record, tracking number, invoice, or receipt for delivery. They lied to convict me, a self-represented person who did not have a lawyer. They lied because they knew they could, because they had the power, authority, and credibility as officers of the court and as senior partners of large and respected law firms. They did it because they were corrupt and wanted to win a civil case so badly that they would commit criminal offenses to do so. My case also involves the actions of a corrupt Ontario Superior Court Justice who backdated that same court order by 10 days to assist the corrupt Bay Street lawyers. That same judge a few years later went to a back room where he secretly, off the court record, made a new and secret court order increasing my prison time by 50 percent. The judge did this without informing me, a self-represented person with no lawyer, and gave the only copy of the new warrant to the prison, leaving no trace of his secret actions on the court record or in his own judge's notations. This was backroom star chamber corruption in our own courts. Yet, the Canadian Judicial Council, supposedly responsible for holding federal judges accountable, refused to investigate my complaint or to even read the court records. I spent 63 days in prison, every day in solitary confinement, as I am a former Toronto police officer. The prison authorities told me that solitary was the only place they could keep me alive, and from what I saw, they spoke the truth. In my solitary cell, I had to clean the feces and blood of previous occupants from the floor and walls. The lights in the cell were on 24 hours a day, 
But the screams and moans of my fellow prisoners didn't allow for much sleep anyway. All this is still celebrated online as a victory by the group of corrupt Bay Street lawyers and their large law firms who wanted to win and did win a high-value civil case by any means possible, including fabrication of evidence, perjury, obstructing justice, and bribery of police to illegally obtain confidential police records. But as disgusting as all that is, there is much, much worse, much worse. The Canadian legal profession, the Law Society of Ontario, and the courts themselves, when confronted with legally made certified voice recordings and other irrefutable evidence proving that the Bay Street lawyers deliberately fabricated evidence and lied to the court to convict me while I was out of the country, when confronted with that irrefutable evidence, the legal profession, the law society, and the courts closed ranks together to save the corrupt Bay Street lawyers, even when that meant knowingly sending an innocent man, a self-represented person in a civil case, to prison. In response to my solid evidence, of criminal wrongdoing by senior Law Society of Ontario lawyers, the courts refused to consider my evidence, my exhibits, and refused to even listen to the voice recordings. In all these years, before the various levels of court, no judge has ever listened to the voice recordings, at least officially. The courts refused to allow me to cross-examine the very witnesses that the judge relied upon to convict and sentence me. That's right. Both as a self-represented litigant and later when I was represented by a lawyer, I was not permitted to cross-examine the lawyers who lied to the court, nor was I permitted to cross-examine the corrupt police officer who had taken a bribe to illegally investigate me for a private civil matter. As a Canadian facing prison, I was not allowed to examine the witnesses who provided the evidence the court used to convict and sentence me. Now let me repeat that slowly and clearly. As a Canadian facing prison, I was not allowed to cross-examine the very witnesses who provided the evidence the court used to convict and sentence me. Now, right now, many of you are thinking, that can't be true. No way. This is Canada. No way. How naive you are. Tens of thousands of your fellow Canadians, though, perhaps more, who have been forced to represent themselves in our courts without a lawyer, know exactly what I am talking about. The rules of litigation, normal court procedures, and the rule of law are not applied equally to self-represented persons, and especially when respected senior lawyers or judges have been caught red-handed in deliberate misconduct. When in prison, I found a lawyer willing to represent me. I finally found a lawyer, and after a month, I was released on bail pending an appeal. But the higher courts would not allow my appeal to be heard unless I first paid up front, in cash, hundreds of thousands of dollars in court costs that had already been awarded to the other side on the basis of their provably false evidence and the lawyer's lies to the court. The courts knew that this requirement to prepay hundreds of thousands of dollars would prevent my appeal, stop it cold, as it would for any ordinary Canadian. And so, my appeal was strategically sabotaged and denied by the higher courts. When I could not pay hundreds of thousands of dollars as an entry fee to have the court consider my appeal and listen to my evidence, 
I had to return to prison and solitary confinement to serve the remainder of my sentence. But that was the intent of the Bay Street lawyers and the courts, and they succeeded in denying me an appeal, and once again prevented my evidence from being heard and considered by any court. By the time I returned to prison in 2014, many judges, hundreds of lawyers, and the leadership of the Law Society of Upper Canada, now the Law Society of Ontario, knew of my case, knew of my voice recordings and other irrefutable evidence. Yet, despite my evidence, or perhaps even because of it, the legal profession united to protect the senior lawyers, their fellow club members, from accountability or any consequence for their criminal misconduct, their perjury, bribery of police, and obstruction of justice. Now, my false conviction and in prison was only possible because there is a level of tolerance by judges and lawyers for corruption in the legal profession and in the courts. There is strong reluctance to damage the careers of fellow lawyers and judges or to tarnish the profession itself by acknowledging serious, deliberate wrongdoing. And, as I was informed, by the over 100 Ontario lawyers who refused to have me as a client, lawyers fear professional and social sanctions from the group if they expose wrongdoing by other lawyers or judges. So, the vast majority of judges and lawyers look the other way and stay silent when they witness deliberate misconduct by other legal professionals. When people in positions of power and authority in our justice system lack the courage and integrity necessary to hold corrupt lawyers and judges accountable, they become participants in the corruption. Looking the other way empowers the corrupt and undermines public trust in our courts and in the legal profession. In the last few years, a major Toronto news media investigation found that in over 200 incidents, Ontario lawyers had committed criminal offenses against their own clients. Theft, fraud, breach of trust, totaling some $60 million and more. Yet, except for a tiny handful, these lawyers faced no criminal charges or sanctions. In the vast majority of these cases, the Law Society of Ontario covered up and kept the offenses secret from the public. The Law Society quietly cleaned up each mess and protected the corrupt lawyers, fellow members of the club, from criminal prosecution, thus concealing the rot and corruption from the public. Until the news story was published, Canadians were kept in the dark. In my case and so many others, when we examine the behavior of the legal profession and of its individual members, both lawyers and judges, we find protection of fellow club members and protection of the profession's image at all costs. We see regular cover-ups of misconduct and a sense of superiority, entitlement and impunity. We also find enforcement of professional and social sanctions against internal whistleblowers and members who would place the rule of law and duty to the public over their loyalty to the group. History has taught us to expect these behaviors where powerful professions or groups have no independent oversight and no external accountability. Why should lawyers and the legal profession be any different? For good reason, we do not allow our police to operate without independent oversight and external accountability. The stories of police abuse, corruption, and incompetence are legion, and in the last few years became a deluge as incidents are regularly documented with solid video or audio audience uh, evidence from mobile phones, security, and dashboard cameras. 
Ontario and many other jurisdictions form civilian investigative units to independently investigate serious police wrongdoing and to lay charges where appropriate. And still, we have trouble holding the police accountable. Unlike police officers, lawyers do not generally commit crimes in the street while surrounded by surveillance cameras and citizens wielding mobile phones. Lawyer misconduct is often done in back rooms with a signature, a few words, a wink and a nod that betray a small client in favor of a big spending long-term corporate client or in the courts where self-represented persons are deliberately steamrolled with a tsunami of tactical motions, aggressive summary judgment applications, and abuses of process that would not be attempted or tolerated if the person was able to hire a lawyer. Many of these abuses against self-represented persons are tolerated and accepted by the courts. So many self-represented litigants report accidentally discovering that the opposing lawyers have been secretly briefing or communicating with the trial judge, sometimes in writing, sometimes in case meetings where the self-represented litigant was not informed. It happened to me several times. I can tell you it's quite common. And when this happens, and it happens very frequently, self-represented litigants perceive, correctly or not, the opposing counsel and the judge are working together against them. This destroys the public's confidence in the courts. The law societies across Canada are on one level a labor union for lawyers. They are a group of friends and co-workers who are responsible for investigating and disciplining the same people they went to school with, the same people they socialize with and meet in the workplace, and the people they meet in court. That works out exactly as you think it would, and the Law Society's primary concern is never about the public trust, no matter how, time, how many times the Law Society executives say those words. It is no longer acceptable that the Canadian legal profession that exerts vast influence and authority into every area of life continues to self-regulate without independent civilian oversight and external accountability. Now don't get me wrong here. The vast majority of Canada's lawyers and judges do their level best every day to deliver the best justice they can within the rules, laws, and system that we have. And thank God they do, because we have all seen examples in other countries what an of what an entirely corrupt system does to individuals and civil rights. To borrow a phrase from Winston Churchill, Canada's justice system is the worst, except for all the others. So to spare not, it's not all bad. There are good people inside and outside of the justice system working to repair the damage, working to provide accessible, affordable, and reliable justice for Canadians. A few months ago, I had the honor of being invited to the University of Windsor Law School to attend a conference of ordinary people, lawyers, judges, law professors, law society executives, a few, and others in the legal system. This was organized by the National Self-Represented Litigants Project. I met and spoke with so many dedicated people, it was uplifting and it gave some hope for the future. But nothing will really change unless and until lawyers and judges have the courage and integrity to act when they see misconduct, abuse, or injustice in the legal profession and in the courts. Which brings me to our final topic. The fact that the Federal Court of Canada secretly uses the Internet to investigate and gather evidence about people and cases appearing before judges of that court was revealed 
in the news media last June. It is proven that judges and or employees of the Federal Court of Canada, FCC, conducted extensive secret online investigations into my case, my witnesses, my lawyer, and me during the over a year and a half that my Canadian Judicial Council judicial review case was before the Federal Court of Canada. As reported in the Financial Post, the above has been forensically confirmed by U.S. computer networking expert and former commissioner on cybersecurity for President Obama, Dr. Eric Cole, in his sworn affidavit filed in the Ontario courts. So, what's the problem with judges and their staff secretly collecting information online about the cases, litigants, accused persons, witnesses, and lawyers appearing before the judge? That's easy. This secret and unlawful court activity strikes right to the heart of our standards for a fair and open trial process. Secret evidence is prohibited in our courts. Persons before the court have a right to see, examine, and challenge all evidence considered by the court and to do so in public. This standard goes way back over 800 years to the Magna Carta and is what differentiates English-based judicial practice from so many other countries and cultures. Thus, in the British, American, and Canadian courts, jury members and judges are not supposed to do independent research in the cases they are considering. This is to ensure that all the evidence the court or the jury members consider is on the record and in public so the prosecution and defense are aware of the evidence, can test it for accuracy, and make submissions as to its value and interpretation in the case. If the judge or jury members consider evidence that nobody else is aware of, they are conducting a portion of the trial in secret. And this is exactly what happened in my case. The issue of no secret evidence in the courts is so important to justice and fair trials that in the United States and Britain, jury members are regularly jailed for violating this prohibition. Recently in Canada, two lengthy criminal proceedings were declared mistrial when jurors were caught independently researching the case. Jurors are usually caught when another member of the jury finds out and alerts the court staff. As one can imagine, though, catching judges secretly investigating cases is exponentially more difficult, although there have been a few recent instances both in Canada and the United States. But this is exactly what happened in my case, and the Federal Court of Canada is in full cover-up mode. It is apparent in the sworn affidavit of Dr. Eric Cole that the Federal Court of Canada was caught red-handed using the Internet and Google searches to secretly gather information about my case and the involved parties and witnesses for over a year and a half. Further, Dr. Cole confirms that the court's administration service that operates the computer network for the Federal Court of Canada maintains records and knows exactly which judges and court staff are involved. In a series of letters between the Judicial and Registry Services and my lawyer, the courts admitted that the court personnel conducted the secret investigations, indicated that the courts have knowledge of the people involved, but refused to identify the judges and or court staff who conducted the secret investigations into my case and my lawyers and my witnesses. Today, for the first time, I am reporting to you that additional forensic evidence has come to light showing that information about which judges or court personnel engaged in this prohibited activity. This information exists in computer network records that are outside of and not in control of the courts. This means 
that not only will my witnesses, intervener, lawyer, and I be able to identify which Federal Court of Canada personnel secretly investigated us and collected evidence when my case was before the court, but it also means that anyone who has appeared before the Federal Court of Canada in the last few years will be able to know if federal court judges or personnel secretly conducted investigations or gathered evidence about their case while it was before the court. As I'm sure any lawyers and judges listening are aware, this new revelation has profound implications for every case that has been before the court in the last few years. One lawyer who contacted me after reading the Financial Post article said he was horrified by the thought that his client's outcome before the Federal Court of Canada might have been the result of secret investigations and evidence gathering by the court. I am aware that a number of lawyers are exploring legal options for their clients and at that at least one motion will be filed within weeks. The Federal Court of Canada can continue to cover up and stonewall as much as it wants to. Canadians now know that this damning information about misconduct by judges and or their court staff exists in computer network records that are outside of and not in control of the courts. I will leave you today with a quote from Supreme Court of Canada Justice Rosalie Abella. So, What's that noise our profession can't ignore? The sound of a very angry public. And it's a public that has been mad at us for a long, long time. Like the character from the movie Network, I'm not sure they're going to take it anymore. And frankly, I'm not sure they should. That from Supreme Court of Canada Justice Rosalie Abella. Well, I can assure Justice Abella that Canadians are not taking it anymore. And this Ontario Civil Liberties Award that I am so honored to receive is tangible evidence that Canadians want their justice system back. Thank you so much.